Now, uh, the next speaker is Thomas Aldrich, and the title is Avoiding Equilibrium in a Minimal Molecular Information Processing System. Please start. Thank you very much. Um, so today I'd like to um, give a quite conceptual level overview of um, uh, a project that's at the heart of what my group does that goes all the way from really quite basic theory all the way through to actual experiments with pipettes and stuff in the lab. Um, so the, the start of this uh, topic is the observation that um, biology does something really quite remarkable, which is um, produces, uh, in the human body's case, I think 20,000 distinct uh, proteins using only 20 ingredients, 20 amino acids. Um, and it does this uh, exactly without producing uh, anything else that it doesn't want to. Now, um, this would be impossible if you just took the 20 ingredients in a soup and said, assemble into exactly these 20,000 um, products and nothing else, um, let alone having some sort of temporal control over when they assemble. Um, it would be like throwing a load of Lego bricks in the proverbial washing machine uh, and hoping to uh, assemble uh, the centre of London. Um, so biology, of course, doesn't do this. It, proteins are assembled uh, through uh, transcription of the sequence of a sequence of DNA bases into a sequence of RNA bases, and the subsequent translation of that RNA sequence into a protein sequence. So the problem that um, there's not enough information in the 20 units themselves to make an arbitrary structure is solved by first um, using a template to create a string of amino acids. And then once you've got that string, the interactions between the amino acids combined with the sequence information is enough to fold into the structure that you want. So <coughs> I, in my group, we, we uh, distinguish uh, this process of, of copying where the product sequence is produced from a template from self-assembly where the internal interactions of the units are all that is used to assemble your product. Now, an important point about copying in this context is that the copies must physically separate from their template for it to work. Um, partly this is because we need the RNA or protein that is produced in these processes to diffuse away from uh, its um, template and go and perform its function in the cell, but partly, uh, arguably more fundamentally, um, if the product never separates from the template, then you've consumed the template in making your product, which means that the next time you want to make another protein, you need to make another template from scratch and making another fundamental template from scratch, which would be the DNA sequence itself, um, just gives you exactly the same problem you had before, but worse because actually you have fewer uh, units to assemble your DNA from than you, than you had your protein. So the observation uh, we've made in our group is that we've been unable to engineer even fairly trivial copying systems um, in synthetic contexts, um, despite the fact that these processes are the three most fundamental processes in biology and essentially underlie all biological complexity. So there's a clear um, incentive to engineer a synthetic analog of these polymer copying systems, but we haven't done it. And the question is, why haven't we done it? And uh, to answer that question, I think it's worth um, looking at how this process relates to a uh, fundamental computational process where, um, can you, you can't see my screen, can you? My, my cursor, can you? Um, just a second. Um, is there a way we to enable my cursor. cursor? We can. You can, okay, brilliant, thank you. So um, initially, I'm, if I've got two, let's say, bits of data, 
two, two bits in my system that are capable of holding data. One holds data uh, and one is a memory that initially holds nothing. Um, I can bring them into contact with them, electrically connect them or something like that, use the connection to set the memory equal to the data and then switch off that connection. And what I've done is I've made a copy of my data in my memory. And at some level, this is what you do every time you uh, save a copy of a file or something like that. You make a permanent copy of your memory that no longer speaks to the data in order to, uh, in order to, to maintain its state. And what Szilard pointed out in 1929 is that this is actually, uh, this process is at the heart of the resolution of the maxwell demon paradox. And what he pointed out was that if you can do this process, if you can take some data, copy its value into memory via some interaction, and then separate the two so that the memory is retained, then um, if you could do it without there being some kind of thermodynamic cost to the process, you'd be able to violate the second law. And um, from that, you can explain why Maxwell's demon and Szilard's engine uh, don't violate the second law. So in our more modern, we would, in our more modern context, we'd phrase this in a slightly different way, which is that if we've got a system, which I've called X in contact with a heat bar, we can talk about the generalized free energy of X, which is a function of the probability distribution over X's states. And it's equal to the uh, average energy of the states of X minus T times the entropy uh, of distribution. And of course, the entropy of the distribution is given by this uh, Shannon formula. Now, the generalized free energy is equal to the free energy of the equilibrium distribution plus this term here, which is the callback Leibler divergence between the current distribution of the system and the equilibrium distribution. And that callback Leibler divergence is strictly positive, which means that the generalized free energy is always bigger than the equilibrium free energy, and this, or greater than or equal to, and this difference represents a store of free energy from which work can be extracted in principle. So if my distribution of states is such that it's not equal to the equilibrium distribution, and my free energy is larger than the equilibrium free energy, then there's, in principle, work stored in my system. Uh, and in order to get to that state, I, I have to put in uh, resources. So in the context of the um, data and the memory that I talked about before, if I initially start out with an equilibrium state where, uh, and we'll assume that all of the, uh, uh, the states of the data and the memory are uh, equal energy. Um, then there are four possible states, zero or one for the data, and zero or one for the memory. So I have an entropy of log four. My energy is, let's say zero, which gives me a free energy, generalized free energy of minus kT log four, and I'm in equilibrium. I can then bring them into physical contact with each other. And if the physics of the system is appropriate, um, that may cause the memory to align with the data which means that I've now got data in state zero or one, but my memory is in a state that's equal to the data. So now I only have two possible states. So my entropy is log two, but I've also got an energy of interaction. And if that is sufficiently uh, negative, then um, I can still be in equilibrium, despite the fact that I've reduced the entropy of my system. Sorry, this should say log two here. My free energy is the energy of interaction minus kT log two. And I'm in equilibrium. Then I separate them. Uh, and of course, I need my memory to retain its state after I separate them. So now I have u of zero, there's no interaction energy, but I still only have entropy of log two, which means my free energy is now only minus kT log two, i.e. it's bigger than uh, what I started with. So I, my F minus F equilibrium is non-zero. I've put in uh, some, I've had to put in work to put the system out of equilibrium. And in theory, there's a resource that I could exploit. So how does that translate into a uh, polymer copying system? Well, that's what Jenny studied as part of her PhD. And um, I've not got time to go into the full story, but the 
the, the essence of what comes out is uh, I could have, uh, if I've got a template sequence here or an alternative template sequence here, um, if I produce accurate copies of my template sequence that are not physically interacting with the template, then I've created a low entropy state because um, the sequences are very specifically correlated with the template sequence, just like my memory was correlated with the data on the previous slide. Um, and um, that low entropy is not uh, common, compensated by an energy of interaction. And so I've created a non-equilibrium state. Uh, and what's more, we can do things like define an efficiency with which we've created this non-equilibrium state, which in this context is effectively how far from equilibrium have we pushed the system due to this low, low informational entropy. So that's delta F inf divided by how much chemical free energy has gone into creating uh, these products. So if we put all of our chemical free energy into creating, uh, if these two quantities are equal to each other, we've managed to channel all of that chemical free energy into making precisely the products that we wanted. Okay, so my background is actually in the field of um, DNA nanotechnology. Uh, and in that field, people have been very successful in designing synthetic DNA strands to self-assemble into particular target structures at equilibrium. Um, and uh, more broadly within sort of uh, chemistry and uh, nanotechnology, people are pretty good at designing systems, interesting systems to make interesting structures, non-trivial structures at equilibrium. And indeed, it wouldn't be very hard, you could do this lots of different ways, um, to design a system where you have a template polymer and some monomers in solution that don't interact with each other very easily when they're in solution, but they selectively recognize the uh, template. When they bind to the template, their polymerization is encouraged by the proximity, and eventually you produce a template with a, uh, with a copy attached to it. Now, what tends to happen in this context is that um, the uh, cooperative interaction associated with the fact that um, uh, if these two particles are bound to each other, it's much easier for both of them to bind to the template than if they're individually trying to bind to the template, leads to a very strongly anchored copy bound to the template. Um, and in the literature, this tendency of products to bind to their templates is known as product inhibition. It's a big deal uh, even for simple catalysts, and it gets exponentially worse as you try to use a template to make a copy of a longer and longer polymer. And typically speaking, um, there's been some success, people have had some success in um, engineering synthetic systems where they allow equilibrium assembly on the template effectively, and then they change conditions to rip the copy off the template and thereby create their uh, copied polymer and recover their template. So this um, non-autonomous way of doing things is quite analogous to how we usually think about applying a protocol in stochastic thermodynamics. So for example, if I've got a two-state system in a double well and I want to push it this way, then I can slowly raise um, the uh, potential of one side, pushing all the probability into the other side. Uh, and when it's 100% in the well that I want it to be, I can quickly um, put up a barrier in the middle and switch the system back to its initial value where there's no energy bias between either side. That slowly, slowly adjust and then quickly switch back is typically speaking the way to, to, to create these um, uh, long-lived um, correlations between things that eventually are non-interacting if you're applying a control protocol. Uh, and this figure here, which I won't discuss in detail, is an example of, 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 of how to do that for a um, polymer assembling system. But cells don't work like that. So cells aren't relying on an environment that is changing over time, typically. Um, interestingly enough, 
um, at the very origin of life, that may have been very important. But at some point, life worked out how to effectively power itself from uh, a constant chemical potential food supply. Um, and there's a good reason for that, because it means you're not bound to stay stuck on your uh, undersea thermal vent. You can go off and explore any environment uh, where, there's, where there's food to eat. Um, and what that means is you can't employ this technique of allowing the system to reach one equilibrium and then suddenly changing the conditions so that now you're out of equilibrium. You've got to stay out of equilibrium the whole way if you want the product to be one of these non-equilibrium states where there's correlations between the product and the template. So uh, Jordi uh, here, uh, who's presenting a poster at this conference on this topic, um, designed a simple thermodynamically self-consistent model to explore how a template which selectively binds to um, uh, monomers that we'd like to assemble into a copy polymer from solution um, might uh, enable the templated production of uh, copies. And we considered reactions such as binding and unbinding from the template, polymerization and depolymerization whilst on the template, and then step-by-step -step unbinding of a, of a polymer uh, from the template. Um, now, as I say, I don't have time to go into the details, but if you make a, a simple model, um, which reflects the fact that um, you have this cooperativity uh, within a copy polymer. So this monomer is much more likely to stick down to the template because it's anchored in place than one that's floating around in solution. The thing never works. You never get effective copying of your template. Uh, so here we use a template of length 30 and we'd like all our copies to be length 30. And we never saw an average copy length exceeding length four or so. No matter how we varied over uh, the, the parameters of the system. We just reproduce product inhibition, or no, we either get product inhibition or nothing sticks. So then we looked at nature and we were inspired by what happens during transcription and translation. Um, so in translation, this is, this is a um, ribosome translating a, a messenger RNA into a protein. And at any one time, only a couple of units are actually bound to the template and the growing peptide chain, the, the thing that's going to be the protein, most of it has already been released. So we developed a model where this polymerization process was coupled to um, a weakening of the bond between the growing copy and the template. So the idea is that in coming in and forming a polymerization bond here, that somehow this new bond is, is taking interactions away from this thing that's holding the uh, template, uh, the copy and template in place. So there's some, the incoming monomer is kind of ripping bonds away from the um, trailing monomer in order to form its connection, thereby weakening the bond, uh, the lagging bond behind the leading edge of the copy. Um, and what we observed, so effectively to try and simulate this. And what we observed, to cut a long story short, is that uh, under a wide range of parameter values, it works pretty well. In fact, better than we expected. Um, this is the fraction of the products that we produce that um, are the right length. And what we observed was under a wide range of conditions, we could get over 90% of the products of the right length, which should compare to nothing being um, more than 10% of the length of the template, with, which is what we were seeing before. Um, so the strategy works. And what we thought is let's try and actually build that using DNA nanotechnology, because as I said, that's my background. So the idea in DNA nanotechnology is that you can design a um, set of uh, reactions into some synthetic DNA strands by carefully choosing their sequences so that you design certain reactions to take place and other reactions not to. Leveraging the fact that we know that 
A bases want to stick to T, C bases want to stick to G, etc. So in this, in this model, the individual units here are sections of DNA that are asserted that are about 10 bases, 20 bases long, something like that. And these bonds that form between them are base pairs, are sets of base pairs, maybe 10 bases pairs, 20 base pairs long. And um, we, we're using the specificity of base pairing in order to give specificity at that level. Um, and we proposed a mechanism which we call handhold mediated strand displacement to achieve what we wanted, which was this in the polymer polymerization step, we weaken the bonds of the back monomer with the template. Uh, so you've spent in, 20 minutes, so please uh, summarize your talk shortly. Yeah, yeah, so it should be about three minutes left. So here's what it looks like. This strand here, I want you to imagine as the template, and it's got a back monomer already in position. And we introduce a, a new monomer that's supposed to polymerize with the, with the back monomer. It comes in, it recognizes the template, binds to the monomer behind it and then due to the way we've designed the sequence it's able to pull the monomer behind it off the template and then potentially detach so we've got round this product inhibition problem using this mechanism that we studied in geordie's model um, so what we studied was a system where we had three monomers of type a here and three monomers of type B, where any pair of these could interact with each other. So A1, B1, A1, B2, A1, B3, et cetera, are all roughly equally stable, but their reactions in solution are slow because they're blocked off by this strand. There's blocking off the base pairing. We introduce a template that recognizes this bit of one monomer and this bit of another monomer, and we selectively produce uh, a product. Uh, and uh, here is a control where we show that um, basically the, the colors are the, indicate the product that we're forming in the reaction, different colors for different products. Um, and if we put in the template for that product, you see that we form exactly the right product in those situations. And what's more, we're able to get high turnover. So we're able to see 40, 50 times turnover for each template unit. So, um, uh, and I just want to note actually that the energetic driving for this process is actually quite weak. There's only about 10 kT pushing the reaction forwards, which means that if we were to go back to that efficiency formula I quoted before, we're probably looking about 5%, 10% efficiency in this process, which is quite interesting, I think, for an information propagation uh, mechanism. So in conclusion, copying of templates creates uh, non-equilibrium states, uh, and therefore engineering copying systems is non-trivial. We think we've got a theoretical mechanism for doing so, and we've got a candidate experimental realization that works for diamonds. The next step is to go to trimers and then sort of as a physicist, one, two, three, four, infinity. Can we do something of arbitrary length? So it just remains for me to say thank you to the people uh, who did the original work here, Javi, Jordi and Jenny. Um, I'd also like to encourage people, if you haven't done so already, there are lots of great posters uh, from people, including uh, those in my group. Um, so do take a look at them and arrange to meet with the uh, poster presenters. If you're interested in this work, here are the relevant references. Thank you.